Hello, I'm Kate Fitzgerald from the Learning Hack team, welcoming you to a new episode of Great Minds on Learning. In this highly acclaimed series, Professor Donald Clark, internationally famous author, blogger and entrepreneur, joins John Helmer to explore two and a half thousand years of thought and theorising about learning from the Greeks to the geeks. This time we examine the impact on learning of Karl Marx, who had a revolutionary effect on the world. In the name of Marx and his collaborator Engels, politicians of the 20th century created regimes that were utopian in some cases, highly repressive and even murderous in others. Meanwhile, the heirs to Marx's intellectual tradition fleshed out Marxism as a rich and powerful explanatory system. And though controversial to this day, Marx's thought has had an enduring effect on learning and education. Welcome, everybody, to this episode of Great Minds on Learning. I'm here with my co-host, Donald Clark, as usual, and the theorists whose thoughts about learning we're exploring this time are the Marxists. And this group is distinct compared to other groups we've covered in one particular respect, uh, as you point out in your notes, Donald, uh, and that's that they all arise from one man and his theories. They may be, we should say, two men if you count Engels. Other groups have maybe had a foundational intellect, who we do first in in its program, that those who come after them build on, interpret, argue with, modify, surpass, and maybe end up demonizing and completely disagreeing with. But in this case, the founding intellect creates something so powerful that it becomes an ism, Marxism, that becomes almost a new category of thought. Marxism is a rich explanatory system, though it's been described in that way, that has a lot in common with the religion, perhaps like Christianity or Islam in its ability to overturn everything in the life of a person or of a nation, though Marx is at pains to represent his ideas as scientific. Marxism portrays itself from the beginning as a complete schism with everything that came before, and a, a paradigm shift, if you like, and the set of ideas that it embodies is, in its influence, incendiary, transformative, and in many ways cataclysmic, and still with us. In his own time, Marx was an unknown refugee scholar living off the charity of his friends, but within 70 years of his death, a third of the human race was living under regimes that called themselves Marxist. And his influence is still with us now, though capitalism has proved far more resilient than he has envisaged. Um, and Marxism has been pretty resilient as well, as we'll see. Donald, we might expect a system so all-encompassing to have something to say about learning. Um, so how would you summarise what Marxism in its original formulation had to say on the subject of learning? And how is that modulated and refined by this group uh, of people who came after? Yeah, well, I suppose Marxism in its purest sense, original sense by Marx, arguably Engels as well, but primarily Marx, is really a hardcore political and economic theory, not an educational theory in any sense. And Marx didn't write much on education, although it pops up in the Communist Manifesto, and he sets the agenda for it uh, by defining education in terms of its social context. So in his social context, we know what the Marxist thing is. But the interesting thing about this group is you rightly said, John, this is not a, this is not a sort of meandering set of tributaries. It's one river of thought, as it were, the Marxism, which goes right through to the other isms, I suppose, structuralism, postmodernism, and so on and so forth, the things we're familiar with now. But that's a direct, these are direct descendants from Marx. In between then and now, we have so Marx is a sort of dominant. Uh, late 19th century figure, you know, dies in, before the 20th century, 1883 or something, 1883, I think. Uh, but we have other, other figures like Gramsci who come along after Marx is dead uh, and redefine Marxism or redefine education in terms of Marx's theory with his own spin. We'll come to that, uh, but hugely influential in his prison diaries. He was he was put in jail by Mussolini. And then Althusser is a bit later, you know, he's uh, at, at post uh, Second World War, really, along with people like Haber Habermas, who are high-end sort of academic thinkers, uh, publish a lot, massively influential, influential in the student movements and politics of the day. Uh, then an interesting one, I think, is Freire, because Freire alone in this group was somebody who actually lived what he thought and actually gave up a position in Harvard to go and teach uh, literacy in the jungles of South America and Africa. So 
one may give him a hat tip for that alone. But this is an interesting trajectory, and everybody is touched by this. We might think that Marxism is a bit remote from us, but it's alive and kicking, and Chameleon Lake has bounced back into action in the recent uh, uh, movements we've seen in our culture uh, uh, amongst young people in our universities and schools. Well, let's start with the big man himself. I mean, almost to get him out of the way. <laughs> Although, you know, it's such big for you, can't really do that. Karl Marx, 1818 to 1883. Karl Marx was a German-born philosopher, <laughs> economist, political theorist, historian, sociologist, journalist. Journalism, very important in what he does. And revolutionary socialist. Uh, very much an activist. Born in Trier, at that time part of Prussia, to a Jewish family that converted to Protestantism, either just before or just after he was born. I had conflicting dates on that. His father was a lawyer who also owned vineyards in Moselle. Marx studied at the universities of Bonn, Berlin and Jena, uh, interesting link to uh, Hegel there, and received a doctorate in philosophy from the latter in 1841. He was excused military service because of a weak chest. Uh, nevertheless, he was able to fight a duel while he was at university. I, I'm not trying to make out that it, this is case of bone spurs that he was uh uh you know getting out of military service uh he, he genuinely was quite ill and struggled with his health all his all his life um possibly from a kind of uh teenage chest illness a young hegelian and that's a a, a thing a category he was influenced by the philosophy of Hegel, who featured in our last episode and the influence of Feuerbach also on his thought is also important he was another young hegelian Blocked from following an academic career by the Prussian authorities' objection to radical ideas, and the atheism of some of these young Hegelians was probably just as shocking to them as their liberalism, perhaps more so. He took to journalism. With Frederick Engels, who he met in Paris, he authored what was to be their most famous work, The Communist Manifesto, published in 1848, a significant year, a year when there were revolutions all over Europe. He's chucked out of Germany, chucked out of France, chucked out of Belgium, and dogged by ill health, he settled in London, where he was to spend the rest of his life, and where famously using the resources of the British Museum, he embarked on a three-volume work, Das Kapital, also a bestseller. It remained unfinished at his death. Donald, there's a lot to be said about Marx, but we are here specifically to talk about his importance for learning, obviously. To what extent do we find that in his work, and that of Engels, or, or is it more a case of what he leaves behind for the followers to pick up on and elaborate? Um, it, you know, what is there in, in Marx about education? Yes, the, we did a podcast on the German idealists, the last one we did, John. And yeah. it's interesting that you mentioned Hegel there because Hegel, also, there's a direct lineage here from the German idealists into Marx and Hegel in particular with uh, what became dialectical materialism, which actually became a, a central plank in a reflection on education. But we'll come to that in a moment. Your, your question was really about the, what did Marx actually say on, ed, uh, on learning and education? And the truth of the matter is not much. <laughs> uh, however, his premise, the premise behind his sort of Marxism, the ism for a moment, was that our very thinking, how we think, what we think, is this determined. The institutions we set up in schools, universities, and so on, are all determined by class structures or, or basic economic structures, which he lays out in Das Kapital and many other texts. So mm -hmm. education is this consequence of this, uh, the way we think in economic terms. We don't realize that, but it's that's what he thinks is true. Now, he, he first mentions that it, his, his Big statements on education really are in the Communist Manifesto, which he co-authored with Engels, of course. Uh, and, he, and he has this big exclamation, and your education, you know, it's almost like a poster. Uh, and it, he defines education as being socially determined, okay? It, the, the conditions under which you uh, are brought up, either as a member of the proletariat or, uh, or, or, or those who are oppressing you in the capitalist class, that's what condition it's education that in a sense plays the role in defining your role in his scientific method although it turned out not to be science okay mm -hmm. so that so he has this and your education defines it as a social context in a sense but he, to be fair he is a bit prescriptive as well in this you know 
he he rants and rails against child labour, wants to abolish child labour. That, that's in the Communist Manifesto. Along with a very interesting, this is where the link with the, the German idealist comes in. He's a big advocate of state-funded education, right out of German idealism, Humboldt, and all the things we discussed there. In other words, he's in line with the capitalists on this one in a certain sense, because that, that became a norm post-Reformation. Hmm. But he he also had views on the way in which education should be now used. You know, and he was actually a promoter of vocational learning. He thought there should be a pride. Other Marxist theorists that will come to think this is true as well, that we almost diminish the pride in work and learning for work uh, towards the more intel, intelligentsia view of education. And he also had a touch of that in him as well. He thought that was a function of our class roles. Unfortunately, dialectical materialism gets thrown into, into this as well. So you end up, of course, with the horrors of the uh, the cultural uh, revolution in China, for example. Uh, you know, we come at that in some detail, if you wish. But there we have millions of teachers, university professors, anyone who wore spectacles was suspect at one point. And uh, so we have this slicing and dicing according to class where... Those who are educated or educate us are then seen as the enemy. And then we get that further slicing, first of all, in the revolutions in Russia, where the intelligentsia gets sliced out, uh, but also others, <laughs> uh, to the horrors of the Cultural Revolution. It wasn't that long ago, you know, in the ne- in 1960s and early 70s. And of mm-hmm. course, it's culmination in Pol Pot, where Pol Pot literally kills every teacher in the country and then goes on to try and kill anyone who even lived in a city. So let's not underestimate the sheer horror, the apocalyptic view of Marxism that led to the deaths of millions of people, many of whom were teachers and educators. Mm-hmm. It's not good. We tend to, you know, put a shining light on the on its route through French intellectual thought into postmodernism and then forget about the reality. And the reality was this was quite horrific. <clears throat> you know, we still have Marxist states. And who are the Marxist states? Well, communist China. You will still see Marx uh, on their on their big jamborees and flags behind uh, the, uh, their Politburo. We have North Korea. Vietnam and Laos are still Marxist, interestingly. And of course, in South America, you have the remnants in places like Venezuela, Ecuador, and so on. So they're in Cuba, of course. Uh, so it's still around and kicking. Uh, mm. Pure form of Marxism. But actually, what we'll be discussing today is more a, a softer form of ma- Marxism. So the Communist Manifesto, that was the first one, and that there was hardly any more detail than that from him, apart from one thing, and this is of real interest to us today, and this was sort of found and resurrected re- recently because they found that Marx had written a very interesting little note, really it was a fragment, not so much an essay, on called A Fragment on Technology. And so he seems to have predicted the idea that it wouldn't have been an industrial mechanical means of production. It would also move into the division of labor would move into knowledge workers as well. And that mm-hmm. these you know individuals would have lots of careers in knowledge work and so on. It was really quite a sophisticated little and very prescient look into the future by Marx. Yeah. Okay. So he thought that education would pass from one sort of one bit to another depending on what society needs. And of course, society no longer needs pure manufacturing. It needs need lots of people who work cognitively. Yeah. So in this fragment uh, uh, fragment uh, uh, on technology, he, he unpacks that. And a lot of people have picked up on that recently. There's a guy called Negri who calls this info-capitalism and has a Marxist analysis on the knowledge economy. Another guy called Dyer uh, Witherford, who does the same thing, but the most common book, which a lot of people have read because it was quite populist, is Bastani's Fully Automated Luxury Communism. Fully Automated Luxury Communism, which is quite an interesting book, actually. And I think that's maybe, you know, for describing the influence of Marx, uh, 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 that book, which you can buy now, it's a, you know, it's a popular book in a way, but it's a th- thought experiment, which is if technology, and let's take AI as an example, which we've discussed many times, Supposing that becomes so productive that we have so much leisure time and that capitalism does what it always does, and that's uh, eliminate labor, then we may, mm. be able to, we may be able to see through this AI phenomenon a world where sort of communism becomes true and that we live on the products of this increase in productivity. And that was capitalism, funny enough, yeah. being a destructive force, becomes in the end a communist ideal. 
very interesting idea, I think. But yeah, but, but it's an idea. It's not happen. in any way a new idea. You know, oh, this idea. People have been putting forward this idea since Oscar Wilde, Solar Man, Solar Man, and the socialism. Um, yeah. We'll have so oh, much yeah. leisure time soon because the machines will do all, all the work and um, spend all our life kind of painting pictures and stuff. And in <laughs> fact, Marx himself thought that capitalism had um, had solved the problem of resource scarcity <laughs> and, oh, yes. and believed that, you know, the, 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 the changes in social conditions would happen automatically bottom up because, you know, the need the, the need to, to to sort of work for every last farthing had, had passed. Cap, you know, capitalism had solved that problem. Um, Francis Wien, in, he talked about pure Marxism as being, you know, what the what kind of Mao and Stalin were doing. But Francis Wien says in his biography of uh, Marx that um, Mark, Marx, and he, he's read all, all of Marx's stuff, that Marx would specifically have, have hated uh, the idea that you had totalitarian regimes doing this stuff because he felt it should bubble up from underneath. It was not, you know, I mean, he wasn't past sort of um, funding people to giving people rifles to go and sort of shoot at people and stuff himself, although that's disputed. Yeah. But he didn't necessarily believe you would have a totalitarian regime to to bring it about. It would happen from beneath. That's correct, because he, he did invest a lot of time and thought into dialectical well, Lenin as well, into dialectical materialism, which is the ongoing unfolding or flow of history that comes from Hegel. And that's absolutely right. It was more of a Heraclitean change will happen and we'll eventually get through this, as opposed to the change will be enforced by a group sitting at the top telling everyone else what to do and how to reach uh, the Whose name's ends in yeah. IN. Yeah. That, that's absolutely spot on there. It's a misconception of Marx that he was this, uh, you know, uh, we have to mechanically slice half the world and kill half the world and impose a totalitarian political regime to achieve the end. He thought it would happen because history would unfold in that way, which is why Popper is right in criticizing one for his historicism. Hmm. And uh, that historical determinism that's deeply rooted in Marx and deeply rooted in, the, I feel, a lot of the way people think at the moment about the end of days, the Millerian, let always get this word wrong, you know, that end yeah. of the world uh, <laughs> view is, a, is, is what, it has a, that's one of the distinct influences of Marx on contemporary thinking, that the world's going to pop and uh, history is unfolding as they think it will, and we're determined to all die horrible deaths in the very near future. That's essentially a Christian thought, end of days. Yeah. And a lot of people, of course, think that Marxism uh, has sprouted from Christianity. You know, the meek shall inherit the earth, as it were. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of reflection on that now, which we'll come to as we speak about the other people. But to sum up on Marx, didn't say a lot about education, but boy, did he have a massive causal effect on others who had plenty to say on the subject. OK, let's hear what they had to say on the subject. Antonio Francesco Gramsci, 1891 to 1937, uh, was an Italian Marxist philosopher, journalist, linguist, writer and politician. Born in Sardinia, his father was a low-level official imprisoned for embezzlement, uh, though the family background was moneyed. Gramsci suffered from a malformation of the spine, possibly due to something called Pott's disease. He was under five feet and hunchbacked. He studied at the University of Turin, but his education was curtailed by money troubles. And like Marx, he went into journalism. It's, it's interesting, the biographies of these people, of the Marxists, they're very often lower middle class or petit bourgeois with possibly a moneyed background, which means that they're de classe in Marxist terms and very often have physical dis disabilities of one, one kind or another and uh, trouble getting funded for their education. All right, let's carry on. He, he wrote on philosophy, political theory, sociology, history, and linguistics. He was a founding member and one-time leader of the Italian Communist Party, a vocal critic of Benito Mussolini and fascism. He was imprisoned in 1926 by Mussolini, where he remained until his death in 1937. Gramsci was one of the most influential Marxist thinkers of the 20th century and a particularly key thinker in the development of Western Marxism, as opposed to the 
uh, Eastern version. He wrote more than 30 notebooks and 3,000 pages of history and analysis during his imprisonment. And these writings are known as the prison notebooks, very influential. Um, and his big hit, so to speak, was Hegemony, uh, which many people think came from Marx. I, for some reason, thought it came from Hegel. I'm wrong. It came from Gramsci. Donald, tell us about his contribution to the thought on learning. Yeah, that's right. So they emerged from that term, actually. So cultural hegemony is his, and, the, and its role through intelligentsia or the intellectuals. That's his big contribution here. And uh, he applies that to education. So just to get that one right, cult cultural hegemony, that's the way in which the dominant class in society it maintains its power by imposing it upon other people whom it seems below it and working for it. And in the context, in the context of education, of course, what he meant was that schools universities and so on are really tools that serve the dominant class and maintain its values its worldview and uh i think there's a i think that's <laughs> as true now as it was then i think that's there's a lot of truth in that that's his cultural hegemony view of the world yeah. and then the second big thing is his view of intellectuals you know he makes this distinction between the uh, traditional intellectuals as a university professors teachers and so on and organic intellectuals so the intelligentsia for gramsci was a new breed of intellectuals who came from across across the class base you know sort of working class intellectuals funnily enough we had a lot of those through the trade union movement you know they were common mm -hmm. when i was young on television jimmy reed was in chat shows and so on they, they've all sort of disappeared on us for some reason which i think is a bit of a shame and now we have a, a sort of oxbridge ivy league view of the world so it's got Perhaps we've had a reversal in that. But Gramsci made a distinction between the traditional state, so, uh, you know, intellect, intelligentsia from the university and school system versus a broader sense of it. And education he saw as a site of struggle. I mean, this is where the this is where the the battle, the political and economic battle was and should take place. It's not a neutral domain, education for Gramsci, you know. So this is why he 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 really recommended this counter counter hegemonic view of education where you had to challenge the dominant narratives and values so that's terribly important and then you have all the critical pedagogy stuff that's where it starts to go really badly wrong i, I suspect and but this massively influences other people like uh paulo freire, freire who we'll talk about in a minute and then an interesting view is praxis the praxis being the combination of theory and practice not just practice in itself right. and then it was this notion of, the, I, I like this idea in Gramsci as well, the school of life, which he, he used that phrase, not in English, of course, but we shouldn't be limiting our view of education to formal institutions. And here he started to get very interesting. The education, especially, I mean, you spend most of your life not in school and not in universities, and you quickly learn that a university is a, and school is a place where everything has a right answer. Actually, in the real world, hardly anything has a right answer, which is why there is such a clash and hardly anybody who can operate in schools and universities actually can operate in the real world because it's a bit messy. So you've got all these idealistic utopian courses and views of the world where there's, there are right answers. And, he, and Gramsci called that the school of life. So I think there are a mixture of things in Gramsci that are really quite fascinating. In education, the hegemony thing, I mean, he thought there were two forms of hegemony by society. There's the, you got people like the police, the army, uh, the judges and lawmakers on one side, okay, so that's the first group of institutions who really impose the class structure on people or their view of the world on other people. And then secondly, you've got all those softer things like schools, universities, churches, trade unions, and so on, who are a sort of softer imposition, but still hegemonic in their attitudes and the way they operate. And he thought the schools laid between those two. They were actually actually in both. They were very formal state-driven institutions with fixed state curricula. And, you know, you get fined if you take your kid out and go on holiday. We're all familiar with that stuff even now. But also on the softer side, it, sort of, it, it injected uh, compliance uh, and conformity into the people who were taught. Because most of the people who teach actually come from the graduate class. And therefore, there's a nice flow there from that, those institutions into schools and into the next crop of learners, making them ready for the world, as it were. But the world that they, they think, or the capitalist world, as Marx thought. So, you know, he was, uh, that, that was his view of schools, that they played that role. And he, 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 I mean, he's no Rousseau-type character here. He didn't, believe, he didn't believe that kids took naturally to learning. He had a lot of strong views on teaching itself. 
but he thought that different classes tend to have really different different views of school and that we should respect that in many ways. Mm. And, uh, you know, we still have schools for the rich. We have a 7% of people go to private school in the UK and they dominate our politics. They dominate the arts. They dominate our university system. And uh, I'm not too sure that things have changed much. The thing that Gramsci critiqued is as true now as it was then. Mm. And it's an uh, an important distinction as, as we go forward that he makes there between uh, the kind of obviously coercive tools of the state, you know, the, the army, the police and all that stuff, and the, the, the softer side, religion, schools yeah. and so on, because that, that will we pick those threads up a bit later. Is there more to say about Gramsci or should we canter on? No, I think that's right. I think I think the, the important strand here is also this intelligentsia view, you know. Yeah. Uh, you know, academics are often seen as being above and separate from us and telling us what to do, but he was highly critical of this. He thought that that was a big mistake and that they had become a bit absorbed in text, you know, and the non-practical side of, of life and that what we do is we... I said, it's in Africa, I'm just back from Africa, I said this repeatedly there, you know, we send kids off to university age five, sorry, school age five, they pop out 20 years later, and by and large, they've just read and read text and written text. Hmm. Uh, now, Gramsci we would have hated that. This is what he attacked. He thought it had been too much emphasis on theory, not much on practice and application, and that that's where everything goes wrong. But he thought that was the means of control. Mm. An interesting idea. But the educated um, individual, he thought, was still a terribly important, played a terribly important role in changing society. He just thought that we we have a false view of educated individuals as institutionally educated. That's the mistake. Mm. Uh, interesting. And it's worth saying that um, uh, people of his kind of generation of Marxists didn't have much access to the academy, to university posts and so on. Yeah. Um, after the war, all that changes. Um, so shall yeah. we move on to our next theorist, who yeah, is sure. very much part of uh, the, the university system? <laughs> We're talking now about Louis Pierre Althusser, 1918 to 1990. Louis Pierre Althusser was an Algerian born French Marxist philosopher, born to a Pied Noir, petit bourgeois family, a fairly prosperous upbringing, a product of French colonial culture like Camus and Derrida, uh, who I almost called a friend of the podcast because you've had lunch with him, haven't you, Derrida? I have indeed, yes. Yeah. So Althusser had a Catholic mother, very important, and Catholicism coexisted with his Marxism. Uh, they, they seem like odd bedfellows, but um, my kind of experience of Mar Marxists, especially ones that I, I met in the, from the, the Labour Party, all, all seem to be ex-Catholics, strangely <laughs> enough. Um, he studied at the elite uh, École Normale Supérieure, a famous university that uh, all these people like Sartre went to as well. But his education was deferred as he was drafted into the French army in 1939 on the outbreak of the Second World War, most of which he spent in a prisoner of war camp in Germany, Schleswig-Holstein. Um, this is where he became a Marxist, first hearing about it from a Parisian lawyer. After the war, he returned to the ENS, where he eventually became professor of philosophy. There he organized lectures with people like Deleuze and Lacan. Among his students were Derrida and Foucault. And we're, we're crashing into another um, ism here, or another couple of isms, structuralism and so on. Althusser is commonly referred to as a structural Marxist, in fact, although his relationship to other schools of French structuralism is not a simple affiliation. And he was critical of many aspects of structuralism. Um, and we start to get once uh, Marxism, Marxist thought really enters the academy, uh, all these kind of terrible battles and snipings and um, yeah. denunciations and, um, you know, re really it all becomes like Twitter within Marxism. And this is where you get this thing where you've got the, the kind of um, CPBML and the CPEML, Communist Party, um, Marxist-Leninist of England, at daggers drawn with the Communist Party, <laughs> Marxist-Leninist of Great Britain. Um, Althusser was a longtime member and sometimes a strong critic of the French Communist Party. He, he suffered from bouts of depression throughout his life after the war and was quite probably bipolar. Uh, now, people tend to think of that 
you don't know about it in quite a cosy way, you know, because um, Stephen Fry uh, is, has outed himself as bipolar. Uh, actually, as I, I know to my cost, my own friendship group, it can have absolutely horrendous results in a person's life. Um, and in terms of kind of violence, imprisonment and so on. Um, and, and in this case, for Althusser, it was like that. In 1980, during one of his periodic bouts of mental illness, he killed his wife, the sociologist Helene Rutman. Um, but he wasn't prosecuted. It, it, it's a bizarre, tragic, but interesting story. And Helene Rutman, he'd, he'd met just after the war. Uh, he, at that time, was um, very inexperienced about life, had, had never had sex she had been a member of the resistance, had um, quite possibly executed collaborators towards the end of the war, had a wide experience of life. And he he, he was desperately in love with her and, and had a kind of rather mother-son relationship with her. I mean, you know, a Catholic mother, he had mummy issues. Let's not get into that. Let's save it for the, for the um, episode on Freud. But he was committed to a psychiatric hospital for three years after this tragic event. Um, especially tragic for Elaine, and died in 1990. Tom, was a sad story. What has been the story of Althusser's influence on learning? As we get the collision of two isms here, Marxism and structuralism, perhaps you could tell the listeners what structuralism is as part of your response. You know, just quickly, right. 25 okay. elevator pitch. <laughs> All right, OK. Yeah, yeah no we'll, pressure. We'll, we'll as we will book. be covering it in episodes to come. <laughs> Yeah, but we'll squeeze another podcast in the middle here. For sure, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's no problem. Yeah, no. The, stru the stru you're right in pointing this out though, because this becomes a big influence on Marxist thought, structuralism itself. You know, early to mid twentieth century, really, uh, the belief that you know human life, languages, culture, liter literature, art, and so on, is not really understandable in isolation, but within within its it, but it's only understandable by its position in a system or structure of relations. Uh, that that's structuralism in a nutshell, really. So, but it's more than that because it, it many structuralists give you a, a sort of method of analysis that that makes you focus on understanding these structures, and that uh, that was thought to be terribly important in terms of culture, language, literature, and God and politics itself. Uh, and this had a massive influence on the humanities uh, of universities around the world, but especially in Europe, of course, in France and Germany and so on, but also in the UK and the US. And it still has a sort of stranglehold, I feel. It's morphed into several other things. So you, structuralism, I'm trying to see what the main points are really. It's the, this notion of the importance of systems and structures, first of all. And linguistics, you've got Saussurian linguistics, that no, whole notion of language as a set of signs, and that uh, a sign is arbitrary, and you only really understand a sign and its relationship to other signs in a system, namely the structure. That that's mm -hmm. a massive influence on people. Although I'm not too sure that most people really understand what they're talking about when they when they when they actually ap apply it. Binary oppositions, they you know, they really really did like to attack that. I think that's one of the really fruitful areas of structuralism that we tend to think in those antonyms, good and evil, and so on, as opposed to shades of grey. Mm -hmm. uh, there. So you got all that Sasurian stuff, and then in anthropology, you got people like uh, uh, Claude uh, Levi Strauss, who, who applies structural myth kinship to totemism and so on. Structural to, anthropology, structural anthropology, absolutely right. And then, of course, the third strand is all this influence on literary theory. So anybody who studied English literature, uh, you know, linguistics and so on, are, uh, would be well aware of structuralism being a very fashionable thing when I was at college and they uh, yeah, very fashionable when I, it was just coming in when I was at Sussex and everyone stopped going to Frank Lover Smith's lectures and started going <laughs> to uh yeah. Gabriel Josipovici's lectures because right. that was critical theory was the that's right thing that's coming in theory and then of course it morphed then into structuralism it got really hammered in terms of being deterministic and ahistorical and a bit odd overstressing that you know this this structural layer at the expense of everything else individual uh, agency or variability in these phenomena so we then go into you know postmodernism and it, it it morphs right into the the whole Foucault Derrida Lacan type world so it's uh that's what it was, but it was massively influential at the time, of course. Mm. And uh, the interesting thing about its relationship, well, if we talk about Althusser for a minute, the 
what he did was put the flesh in the bones of Gramsci. So he says, yeah, you're right, Gramsci, but we had, and let's call them the ideal, this is where the structuralism thing comes in. They were very good at inventing uh, vocabulary. So he, he calls these things ISAs. That's not the saving account that we're all aware of, John. Uh, these are the uh, ideological state apparatuses. In other words, th these are schools. These are universities. Now, he also has these things called the RSAs, which are the repressive state apparatus, and that's the army, police, prisons, court. So again, that binary that Gramsci brought up between the kind of... That's exactly it, John, yeah. yeah. So he's really picking up on distinctions formulated well by Gramsci, but, get, Gramsci, but giving them more flesh, more definition. Uh, now, it, he thinks this is just... The, well, he's a true Marxist, so he thinks this is the way history will unfold that the dominant class will, of course, use these state apparatuses uh, to, to oppress other people, but that will let, then lead to revolution and, and enlightenment. So it's not it's not some weird conspiracy theory, you know, it's not so some people sort of deliberately get a book, a blank piece, piece of paper out and design these systems to oppress people. It's the way it represents economic development unfolding in a sort of dialectical he Hegelian manner, if that makes sense. So. So you have the ISAs and the RSAs. The ISAs are the ones we want to concentrate on here because that's school, okay? That And he thinks that the ISAs are really, they're very smart and that schools, he thinks that right down to the level he discusses grading and assessment and exams and credentialism as the primary means of control. And I think he's onto something here because I think there's a crisis in relevance and credentialism we see in schools and universities now. You know, everybody's got bits of paper, nobody cares sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But he thought that that was a method by which the ruling class imposed themselves upon others, a process of filtering and exclusion. You know, it was his old signaling. It was a Kaplan view of the world. And that this is this is really, sort of for him, you know, the state does this. The state wants this because it wants to, to, to streamline people into certain types of work in the way that they will serve the state. So the selection is very, very deliberate in that sense. Uh, <clears throat> And another one for Althusser's religion, he thought religion played a similar role, and especially when it was in schools, you know, if you go to a Catholic school, you will know that, or a Jewish school, or an Islamic school, uh, which, which, is, which is a bit odd, really. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, it's odd to be a Marxist and think that those schools should even exist, <laughs> given Marx's view of religion. And that was true, certainly, of Althusser. He, he thought they shouldn't exist. And uh, I would agree with him <laughs> on that one. I think... Uh, the way in which religious ideologies clash, even in our modern world, witness what's happening this week, the horror of that, mm -hmm. that perhaps the, perhaps the Marxists had a, a thought here. And they really played a significant role in making state systems secular, certainly in France, obviously, but like it was right yeah. back to the French Revolution, but in other states as well. We've, we have a de minimis view of the role of ed, religion ed, in schools in many countries. And that's partly due to the influence of Marxist type thinking as well. Yeah. So it's, um, it, it's interesting that. Really... Sorry, it's interesting sorry. what you say about ideology and, and schools. It, it was a university that first occurred to me that schools were at all ideo ideological. Yeah. Uh, because you, you, we'd, we'd had quite a, you know, in, in hindsight, could see we had quite a liberal crop of history teachers at my school, and uh, they were they were younger ones. Um, there were young teachers, there were older teachers who'd been through the war and had bits missing and generally were extremely kind of hardline and right wing. And then yeah. the new younger crop were were all kind of Oxbridge educated liberals. Um, we, we did the Cold War and um, stuff like that. Then I went to university and I mixed with people who'd been to schools where they got a completely different take on history. So I, I got into a conversation with uh, someone I was rooming with who was... Um, a member of the local conservative society uh, on campus. And he started railing against, wasn't it a terrible thing when the Tsar liberated the serfs? Isn't that what caused all the problems? And I, I was kind of like, hang about, that's not the way we learned it. <laughs> um, and, and then you would find that, you know, various different schools had been teaching different stuff and, and, and it depended on what the prevailing ideology of that school was. You know, people from yeah. public schools had a completely different take on things from us in the state sector and so on. Well, I, I had a similar but almost totally bizarre encounter with full milk camp, uh, Marxism at university. And uh, when I went to university, I shared a room, literally two beds in one room. 
uh, with a guy called Robin Pearson, who was studying German in fine art at Edinburgh University. Mm. And he became uh, really the head KGB spy for the whole of the UK. I didn't discover this until a Panorama program all about him in 1993 when myself, mm. I remember I'd gone on holiday with this guy, you know, he was a, a good friend of mine, drinking buddy as it were. I uh, didn't know, and he had been uh, he'd been spying for twelve years. By that point, they found out when the wall was knocked down. They found his file, uh, and uh, I've subsequently had all sorts of dealings with spy-like people. But uh, that was a harsh reality for me when I discovered that uh, you know actually I was sharing a room with a <laughs> a, a, a full-blown Marxist who really did believe this stuff and really did want to destroy the country that we lived in. Now that. That was really interesting to me, and it, it let, you know when I this is 1993, so it was four years after the wall came down because mm. all the burners had all the paper shredders had burnt out. But they came to the British files; they had burnt out. But they only knew his code name. But they eventually got charged, of course, uh, for for spying. But he was the head honcho and had you know full invisible ink, you know transmitter, 500 marks a month type spy. Yeah. Recruited lots of intellectuals now what's interesting about that story was that you know this is the this is the gramsci altus review of the world the intellectuals still have a great role to play and marxists really thought that targeting them was useful because they had such an influence on the rest of society that they were the people you would go after first he wasn't interested in recruiting workers in any sense it was the intelligentsia in the university system he was after because they had most influence but uh, yeah, we, we we grew up in that era, didn't we? When when it was a real thing, when the Cold War was a real thing. Mm. Oh, absolutely! And you know, there there were kind of deputy spooks on campus, and you know, mm -hmm. um, in fact, uh, there were a lot of Iranian students there, and they, they they said one in five of the Iranian students on campus at Sussex was was a spook. Yeah, well, we know the 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 modern version of that, of course, is the is the new sort of. Cold War 2.0 sort of thing is, isn't really with Russia, who are a diminished state. It's with China. That's where all the effort's going in terms yeah. of defense spend. And of course, the same thing is ha happening. The, we've had uh, we've had Chinese spies in the House of Commons, and we, it's quite clear that the Confucius Institutes, for example, have played a major role in that. And they are all attached to major universities. And so you, the same thing is playing out as it has always in the past. We just have a new enemy. But remember, the new enemy, in a sense, is a Marxist government. Uh, the, the Chinese government is avowedly Marxist. Hmm. So if we it's didn't have enough of our own. Here, John. Well, it's all still kicking around. Yeah. So Althusa, we, we've kind of got off the point of Althusa. Yeah. It's there more to say than just he established the uh, education, you know, in both its kind of, well, <laughs> at, as, a, as an ISA, so to speak, yeah. uh, was ideological. And he gave us that word ideology. Which is which yeah. is huge, really, isn't it? I mean, you know, uh, it, it it's perhaps ironic that the Marxists start using the word ideology as a yeah. pejorative, and that kind of gets turned around. So the Marxists get called ideological by the conservatives, who say they're not yeah. ideological, um, yeah. and, and now ideology is a kind of uh, it, it it's a proxy word to indicate that somebody's a, a screaming Marxist. You used, you know, by somebody on GB News or whatever, which is ironic because there's just as much ideology on the right as on the left, as we know. And, you know. This is why Popper was so interesting. You know, he, Popper was decried when I was at university as being a bit of a spoiler on all this, but he turned out to be right. In other words, those who often use the word ideology assume a position, a non-ideological position, which, of course, is ridiculous because any sophisticated theory of ideology would, uh, would, would show the, that that was a fallacy. And what Popper did was classify types of theory and what he called a universal theory. So he accuses Plato of this. It wasn't you know, Plato, he accuses Freud of this. And he also, uh, of course, famously includes Marx in this, that any theory that has a a claims to, uh, to be an explanation for everything means that you can't criticize the theory because you're seen as ideological. So you cannot criticize Marxism because even the criticism would be from a class perspective. You can't mm. criticize a uh, Freudian psych psychoanalytic theory because you're actually ultimately being controlled by hidden forces in your unconsciousness. Uh, so I think Popper won the day here. You know, we the, the escape from these grand narratives and universal theories are 
uh, are to accept the fact that the world is complex and that uh, there is no known ideological position. But the two big words, hegemony and ideology, you're right, they come mm. from Gramsci and Althusser, and people often don't know that. They use those words, but don't realize that they are freshly minted coins by the Marxists themselves. Yeah, and of course Althusser did um, himself say that um, ideology can only really work when uh, the, the person using, <laughs> you know, putting across ide ideology uh, believes that they are neutral offering a neutral viewpoint you know yeah i'm speaking and, to you as you know and uh, what i'm saying is completely neutral i'm a neutral observer you know um and that is the most ideological yeah. sort of form and, of communication there I is think, i think this is why alfred's are concentrated so much in education he really did believe that education was the least neutral activity imaginable in society. You know, he really yeah. went for his throat saying, it gives you the illusion of objectivity when in actual fact it is not. And uh, I think there's a great deal of truth in this. So, you know, the, the, the sort of a, a modern manifestation of this would be the belief that the university system is somehow neutral above everything, the grand narrative, the, you know, the place where truth is discussed. Yet we know with absolute certainty that there is a massive progressive left my world i mean I'm, I'm one of those people a massive left-leaning progressive bias in academia it's huge mm. and so the 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 fact that it, it, it it's politically neutral is a nonsense of course mm. uh, and thank god for democracy i would say because everybody deserves you know those are the people who often have the voice in society the voice less only have one thing that's look that little weak vote but boy do they express it as we've seen recently in recent history, so I think I think Althusser is very interesting on that point of, of you know education being a, really, even though you may not think it, a very ideological ridden world. So I think he's right. I think we're moving towards talking about you know how ideology is kind of expressed and communicated, which brings us towards our next theorist. Jürgen Habermas, uh, 1929, uh, still among us, though obviously quite elderly now, mm. is a German philosopher and social theorist in the tradition of critical theory and pragmatism. Born in Dusseldorf with a cleft palate calling for corrective surgery, uh, leaving him with a speech dis disability, which he, he says calls him to, to focus on communication um, more. A difficulty very often hones your, your awareness and sense of um of that particular thing i suppose is the thinking uh his father was a member of the nazi party and he himself was a was a leader in the hitler youth mm -hmm. now donald all these people you've been to lunch with like derrida how many ex-members of the hitler youth have you actually met <laughs> that's true yes a uh, none uh, uh, I, uh, I beat you a uh, one a <laughs> oh, one right that's good <laughs> although my although my son had a girlfriend who's a father or grandfather was in the Hitler Youth, and he was surprised when he opened the family pictures and found them all dressed in sort of SS uniforms. And yeah, so, well, yeah, 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 you know, yeah. One degree of separation. <laughs> yeah. was, was that an Oxford fancy dress party? Oh, no. Was, <laughs> yeah. Post war, uh, Habermas studied at the universities of Göttingen, Zurich, Bonn, and then in Frankfurt under Horkheimer and Adorno. And this is, of course, the Frankfurt School, very important in neo Marxian thought. Uh, but then at Marburg, after he fell out with Horkheimer, Horkheimer um, insisted on changes to his dissertation, which he couldn't stomach, um, and so he left, went to Marburg instead. Professorships at Heidelberg and Frankfurt, uh, a job at the Max Planck Institute, and a whole host of awards and visiting professorships and, and, and various posts and so on. So very much a part of the academic uh, establishment, fated and awarded and so on, which is kind of contrast with the earlier load of um, Marxists who just couldn't get arrested in, in academe. His work, according to Wikipedia, addresses communicative rationality in the public sphere. Public sphere was a, a, an interesting concept of his. Um, I don't fully understand what the communicative rationality means. I, I think it's probably got something to do with where he says that the Enlightenment was an unfinished project um, and he is kind of assertive 
asserting the importance of rationality. But hopefully, Donald, you can make all that a bit clearer for that for us in the course of explaining what he adds to understanding of learning. So yeah. So uh, on the communicative rationality thing, do you want to focus on that first, or whichever way you want to take it, Donald? Yeah, well, well let's do that because it's a, bit, it's a bit of an odd term actually, and it's typical of the sort of Marxist. Uh, <laughs> spinning theories out of theories out of theories in a sense but communicative rationality for habermas i think if i get if i get this right is that's in stark contrast to most communicative action which is instrumental rationality in other words the sort of debate you might see a trump debate or a political debate on tv or the debates you find in the house of commons he would call that instrumental rationality between people who have sort of fixed positions are going to stick to them anyway mm. <laughs> He thought there was a way of freeing ourselves from ideology and hegemony, uh, to pick up those two terms, by having this thing called a, a communicative rationality. So you get people together. The goal is not, it's about dialogue, openness, cooperation, free thinking. That's the idea, like brainstorming almost. Mm -hmm. And so he calls these ideal, I can't remember what, speech situations in one description, I can't remember what exactly called it. But what you have to do is make sure that you get rid of any form of, sort of ideological coercion by anybody in the room. You know, there has to be a sort of non-judgmental thing. So all this, all the, all the debate is transparent, truthful, and a, and a search for real honesty and authenticity. It's a big Marxist thing. So, and now he differentiates between what he calls, <laughs> this goes into a ridiculous amount of detail for what basically is a chat <laughs> amongst like-minded like, the, uh, like people in a search for the truth. But he, he is this guy, He's really a rationalist in a sense, an ultra-rationalist. You know, this rational discourse was terribly important to us. And you get that word discourse coming in a lot into mm -hmm. Marx here as well, because this was a result uh, really of Habermas's yearning for a public sphere that could be critical of everything. And he meant that in education. You have to validate the claims, of course, but he thought this was terribly important for education. And that, uh, you know, it's a sort of neutered form of Marxism, really, which is, we have all this oppression and hegemony, uh, ideological stuff floating around, a lot of oppression. How do we bring about change here? Well, we do it through reason, through discussion, and not conflict. And that he thought that education would play a massive role in this if we got it right. And so in education, education itself must be open to the sort of critical pedagogy idea that we recognize that there are ideological forces at work in education, and we must be honest about them reflective about them and even try and change them you're getting in a dodgy ground here because you know the education system is if it's state funded as a result of the democratic system and the wishes of the parents and people who vote for it a uh, an, an intellectual coming in from the side saying well let's just stop learning maths and sit back and be have some loads of critical pedagogy about whether the power structures in the school are right seems a bit odd to those people because that's not what they're really after so it it in a funny sort of way, it's quite aloof. He also thought it was true of an, an action research. So you get a lot of this in the university system, lots of people who think actually their role in life is critical pedagogy and that action, the sort of, really the ha Hamarasi's action research agenda should be their agenda, that all knowledge has a social context and that's what we're going to study for the rest of our lives. Okay? And they're, they're a bit dismissive of technical education and the scientific approach much more qualitative in, in the view. Sociology departments typically are, you know, Habermasian <laughs> rather than scientific. Mm. Uh, and uh, Because they believe that actually what their role in life is, is to free people from the chains of their oppression. I think this is quite dangerous and wrong. It's highly ideological, in fact, to, to bring up the debate we mentioned earlier. So, you, you know, there's a lot of talk amongst these people about changing the curriculum towards inclusiveness and so on. And then they all end up sending their kids to private schools, of course. <laughs> I found a lot of that in my life. Uh, people in the DFE and elsewhere, you know, where will your kids go to school? Oh, interesting. So there's a lot of, uh, you know, Nagel called your in equality and partiality. A lot of people have publicly expressed morals, which are very different from their privately expressed action. Mm. To be fair to the Marxists, uh, the, the, most of these people thought that was the problem that theory and action should be one and the same thing. Most people are quite good at compartmentalizing this. But Habermas really did believe in politicizing this stuff. And he took it really seriously. And a lot of people have picked up on this and who believe we should have local groups that discuss political issues in your at the street and local level. So he wrote, he wrote this book called The Structure Transformation of the Public Sphere, which is all about this. 
you know, that we should be, let's forget about the capitalist public sphere for a moment, which is television, the media, newspapers, uh, parents' evenings and so on, and have our own public de debate and discussion. It's a sort of democratic view of the, wor the world, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think actually what that has happened, and let me explain why. I think that happened with the internet. I think the internet is a Habermasian experiment. We have the transformation of the public sphere into a global phenomenon where I can discuss politics as I have this morning with people in Palestine, Israel, and the US and Europe. Uh, that was never available before, but we can have open discussion there. It happens to be, when you have open discussion, you don't get that nice, gentle Habermasian, let's all sit back and be very nice to each other. It actually turns out to be much more conflict driven than you would ever imagine on social media, of course. But it's a Habermasian view of the world. To be fair, he was a Marxist with a, a streak of, you know, freedom of expression as well, a strong libertarian view of the world in that, in that sense. But mm. I, I think the action research stuff, I have very little time for it. I criticize it because it's soft, it's woolly, and it leads to educational research that goes nowhere. Huge sums of money spent on this stuff uh, by the critical pedagogy people as its own journals and so on. But I think it's largely uh, screaming in the dark. I think you've been very critical of Habermas. I think a lot of people think that sounds quite good. The idea that we would sit around and we would discuss things, uh, acknowledge our ideological positions and so on, rather than, you know, turning the whole of discourse into uh, a fight for a knife in the dark or whatever the phrase was, which which seems to be happening on Twitter. I mean, I don't know what, what Twitter you go to, Donald, but my Twitter over the last week has been absolutely unbearable because it, it's full of misinformation, it's full of faked up memes, and people yeah. essentially yeah. shouting at each other, screaming at each other with yeah. very little kind of of the type of discourse that Habermas is talking here about here. Isn't there something to be said for his his kind of um his, his enlightenment view that rationality can still be kind of you can still have rational discussion in the public sphere? Oh, yeah. Oh, no, I wholly agree with that. But uh, I had an interesting example of that this week. You know, I was in Africa and South Africa in an academic environment, all academics. And there were some English people there, one in particular. And I brought up the fact that I voted for Brexit. And you would think that I had been an SS member during the Holocaust or something, yeah, yeah. the way I was treated. So I'm all for favor of this, but don't imagine for one minute that it exists, even in higher education. Try, try mentioning the fact that you voted for Brexit in a higher education context and see what happens. See, so it's hard enough to neutrality and rationality goes very quickly. It goes, it flies out the window at the speed of light. So I, I agree with you. I think I think that discussion in the public sphere is interesting. But when you try it, I mean, I had to, you know, when I was deputy chair of the Arts Fest, uh, Festival here, I used to go along to events post Brexit and say I voted for Brexit, and I would be the only person in the room. And this is what the Marxists say. They say, don't forget that all of these institutions who say they, they, they say they promote debate and openness and rationality are actually playing another game here. So right from all of these theories, Marx, Gramsci, Althusser, Habermas are saying, actually, you might think that they're public debates, but they're not really. Hmm. True open debate actually happens very rarely. I, I have to think that social media is actually the place where a lot of this does take place. There is, of course, a lot of noise because it creates friction. Nevertheless, I have a lot of very rational and interesting and quite deep, you know, I find deep articles and debate on the internet in a way that I don't in going along to a Brighton Arts Festival debate in the Dome or something, you know? Hmm. I think, yeah, I'm caricaturing in a way. And, you know, a lot of on, online discourse is, is really productive and useful. Yeah, um, yeah. And you have, you know, you have threads, you have, telegram you have whatever and whatsapp groups and, and all the rest of it it's not all like twitter but no no thank god no i think it's very fruitful i mean i think you know i've spent a, a lot of time you know just reflecting writing and i find it's such a fruitful source of thought from other people you know that people i respect and like and increasingly for example all my interest in recent interest in ai i can't tell you how many research studies just pop up on twitter and facebook mm. for me that uh, the sharing is phenomenal and that, that's yeah. what we're doing here. You know, we've what, how many podcasts we've done thirty odd, but we're, to be fair, we're sharing it for free. We're, we're you know we're doing it for free. I think that's a good thing. I think we can have a, a dystopian view of social media, which is 
fair at times, but there's also a positive and beneficial and sharing culture in that world that doesn't exist in institutions or institutional type debate. And I think we're moving now to another theorist who retakes us into different dif- different territory. I think, you know, the kind of specificity of place in where Marxist thought has landed and unfolding folded is is really quite significant. You know, we talked about Western Mar- Marxism, then you have the kind of uh, the, the the China take on it and and all the rest of it. Uh, and now we're moving to South America. Paulo Reglas Nevis Freira. I, I hope I've pronounced maybe one of those four, four names properly. 1921 to 97, um, was a Brazilian educator and philosopher who was a leading advocate of critical pedagogy. Born to a middle-class family in Brazil, he became familiar with poverty and hunger from an early age as a result of the Great Depression. Again, you know, lower class, middle class, de classe. Uh, a late starter on the educational front, Freire stated that poverty and hunger severely affected his ability to learn. So he, he had a real experience of, of poverty and hunger, which, you know, so many of us in, in countries like the UK don't, although we talk about it a lot in terms of happening to other people. Um, these experiences influenced his decision to dedicate his life to improving the lives of the poor. I didn't understand anything, he wrote, because of my hunger. I wasn't dumb. It wasn't lack of interest. My social condition didn't allow me to have an education. Experience showed me once again the relationship between social class and knowledge. I think it's a very interesting and powerful quote there. But he did get there. Ferrer enrolled in law school at the University of, uh, is it Recife? Admitted to the bar, but instead worked as a secondary school teacher. I mean, he never actually practiced law. Uh, then he ended up heading up the regional department of education and culture, the part of Brazil where he was. Um, working primarily among the illiterate poor, Freire began to develop an educational praxis that would have an influence on the liberation theology movement of the 1970s. Um, some people will know a lot about that. A coup in Brazil put an end to all that. He was imprisoned, then exiled to Bolivia, worked in Chile for five years, we know what happened there, and with the UN, and began to publish. Offered a visiting professorship at Harvard, then he moved to Geneva, an advisor to the World Council of Churches. In 1980, after years of exile, he moved back to Brazil because political situation had changed there. His influential work, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, is generally considered one of the foundational texts of the critical pedagogy movement and was the third most cited books books in the social sciences as of 2016, according to Google Scholar. Donald, this guy's biography is such a contrast in every way to that of Habermas. Without seeking to draw an invidious comparison there, does that show what a broad church Marxist thought has become by this time? And what would you say is Ferrer's distinctive contribution to learning? Yeah, that was a very good, uh, very good biographical sketch there. I was listening really carefully to that because, <laughs> I, I'm, as I said, I've been in Africa twice this year, first time in Senegal and then second time quite widely traveling around South Africa, east to west, north to south, something. Uh, and you know, on both occasions, it struck me how much theorizing and how much, how much of my own perspective is very northern hemisphere. And Marxism is a very northern hemisphere phenomenon. If you think about its origins with Marx in the British Library in London and Europe, where he was born, spreads into Russia, goes across to China, Pol Pot. It's all northern hemisphere, you know. And actually, most of the world's poor, of course, live in the southern hemisphere, South America. Uh, and of course, that vast continent, which is Africa. And what mm. is really interesting about Ferreira is, at last, we, are, we do have somebody who did live what they believed and gave up and refused to bow to the ideological view of institutions in the Northern Hemisphere, where he would have lived a very comfortable life, and went back to South America, worked in Africa also. So you have to, also Central America. So you have to really admire him for this, because he really took the Marxist idea that you, that education is a highly political thing, uh, that there's no neutrality, that it's ideologically ridden, and that if you want to change the world, you have to be there and change it. 
uh, but he actually did this. But it was very interesting, very student centered, this thinking. And I th that's what I find, you know, I'm not a Freire fan, but I do th think that he's one of the few theorists that that there are a few Marxists who focused on students or learners as opposed to teachers, which is the sort of Gramsci and Althusser Hammer. I, I, I don't know this view of the world, which is there's an intellect intelligentsia who who provide the means of change. He didn't really believe that was true. He felt actually the most important thing were the students here, which I think, and he focused a lot on literacy. Literacy was his big topic because he thought, and I, I quite like this side of uh, Thera, the idea that language plays such a fundamental role in education because most people are reading, writing, speaking. They're not doing stuff, you know? So he had this, he had this uh, quite interesting. It was almost AI generative in view. He thought that you should create themes that come from the social community in which you, li you live. So you get you identify those themes. That might be if you live in the jungle in the middle of the Amazon, then it's a completely different ball game from living in São Paulo in Brazil in an urban environment in a slum or whatever. Uh, but he thought that you should actually draw these themes. Where do you live? What is your what are your real needs here? And that they're discussed in what he calls cultural cir circles. So you get you you start to build up a picture, this sort of thematic universe, which is based on words. Now, he thought that the vocabulary that you used in education was terribly important. And he, right down, he stripped this back, the minimus view of the world, 17, 18 words, you, you order them phonetically, and then you start to teach people how to read. But those words and the vocabulary and the language you should be, should be the language you use in your social community eh, among your own family and culture. Now, having just come back from Africa, and when I was in Senegal, you know, it's quite clear that the two colonial languages, English and French, are still dominant in teaching. And yet that's bizarre because Africa is a linguistically diverse place. And when you walk out into the street, nobody's speaking English or, you know, they were speaking several languages, including Zulu when I was there. I even got my avatar and AI to speak in Zulu to address the, the Gino I did, which worked quite well, actually. But, you know, being sensitive to people's culture and language was important for Freire. And I think he's absolutely right. This is why I think AI will, because it's going to be these big multilingual models that are emerging where you can do it in 100, 1,000 languages. I think we may have a revolution in this front. I think Freire would have admired and liked this. Now, the reason he focused on students a lot was he came up with this concept, which wasn't new, to be honest, of banking knowledge. In other words, you know, you deposit knowledge in the user's head like a bank account. It's not a original theory by any manner of means, but this was... This is a wee bit, you know, this is what the basis of his critical pedagogy. So, you know, what, what you've got to do is get the learner to have agency and understand what's happening to them in the educational context. And that they should not only have agency, but some say and power in that, in that context. Mm. Uh, of course, this is incredibly difficult because it all gets very mushy and very weird very quickly. Uh, it's, busy. it's also really massively ambiguous, a lot of this stuff, you know, with a lot of jargon. You know, you've heard me describe his method of literacy, for example, uh, you know, the whole cultural circles, thematic universities, vocabulary universities. It's all very sort of technical in a way. And I'm not too sure that it's particularly practical for working teachers in a primary school. Hmm. But the abstract jargon, to put that to one side for a minute, is fundamental thing is thoroughly Marxist, the idea that schooling education is not neutral, it's highly ideological, and that uh, he has this weird critiques of things like you know, well, the concept of consciousness raising was a big deal to him. I'm not too sure how wise this is in the context of schools, but he's our final figure here because he has to be admired for actually practicing what he preached as opposed to just writing books about things and living in a fancy apartment in Heidelberg or Paris or Frankfurt. And he brought our attention to the dire needs of those in the Southern Hemisphere uh, of the world's poor. And having just, you know, just a few days ago, we were driving out of Cape Town through miles and miles of tin shacks and townships. It was an immense body of people who are as far away from education as they've ever been many, in many ways. You know, I was giving talks in universities and so on, but... Uh, you could just look over the horizon and see a sea of the, in that case, urban poor. And you wonder whether education really is serving them or serving what the Marxists would call <laughs> the ideological position of the dominant class. 
and I feel quite strongly in that now. I actually have come to the conclusion that it does the university system. We funnel all everybody towards it in schools, and yet the, the kids who don't make it are sort of ceremoniously dumped. I think we've we're in a position where the, the Marxists, funnily enough, are right. <laughs> So thank you, Donald, for opening us up to this group of such surprisingly diverse and interesting thinkers. And yeah. I have to say, from my own point of view, people with very interesting biographies as well. I'm sure a lot of people would not have browsed this particular aisle in the great supermarket of learning theories solely because of the fact that Marx has been and continues to be the bogeyman, the great Satan. Astonishingly, really, after... 175 years, it's 175 years now after the publication of the Communist Manifesto. And, you know, it surprised me when I thought of that, nearly 200 years. Mm. Um, but we're still talking about it, you know, and obviously the conditions of life and schools and uh, politics and everything was completely different back in 1848. Um, so people have had to kind of work to continue to apply this stuff, but they have, and it, and it seems to have been fruitful in many ways. Um, less fruitful in some of its applications in uh, in regimes. Yeah. But I won't ask you to add up the credits and debits for Marxism in the general <laughs> sense. Um, I think you've given us a sense of that. Uh, I feel I ought to ask a more focused question at this point, okay. which is how influential do you think the intellectual tradition of Marxism, or perhaps more accurately, the collection of intellectual traditions, because it's clear with the work of Habermas that he, he is pulling threads together there we have kind of structuralism we have the frankfurt school blah 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 so that collection of intellectual traditions that we've seen represented today by these thinkers um how influential how big does it play now in the world of education and learning yeah how does it play now i, I think one obvious example of how dilute marxism is still there is i i i'm i'm in and out of universities all the time I just spent 10 days you know speaking in them in in africa it's it, less so there but certainly in europe and north america when you walk in through the door and you come from the private sector like myself you're treated with massive suspicion and you you start hearing words like capitalism being thrown thrown around and so on and i think in a sense, Marxism is still alive and kicking that type of ideological Marxism still exists in academia. You know, it's all managerialism, industrialization. You know, it's the sort of old Marxist language you hear just being dropped gently into the conversations. I was, you're my enemy. <laughs> yeah. But actually, a more interesting area, I think, is the way in which you might say that the, the current social justice movement, for example, I think is a very, very interesting example of this. And and, and actually, at the moment, endlessly fascinating, because I think the deep roots of the social justice movements are in Marxism. And then, actually, you rightly teased out structuralism and postmodernism, because those are the two manif chameleon-like manif modern manifestations of Marxism that are everywhere in the language of the social justice movement. And I'm not making a judgment on the rights or wrongs of the social judgment movement. I'm just making an observation that, in answer to your question, John, it's alive and kicking in the very language you hear. The, the words hegemony, and uh, you hear that all the time, you know, the, the, the language of the postmoderns, especially, if you like Foucault, Derrida, Lyotard, mm -hmm. and, Lacan and so on. And I'm familiar with those people. Uh, and then you have other manifestations. It, it, it sort of, it's almost like a cloud that completes, like, bursting out a new, a, new, a, a new cloud off the side of itself. You then have it moving into Crenshaw's intersectionality, which is, I think, quite banal, to be honest, but it's there. That is absolutely Marxist in its, in its view of the world. Into right down to the tiniest little area of studies, which become almost little mini faculties in universities, like fat studies is a real subject. I didn't know this until recently. Linda Bacon is, Linda Bacon, curiously, is the, is the great academic in that area. You've got the whole queer theory thing coming through Butler and so on. But it's all fundamentally, when you read the stuff, it's really quite interesting how, how banal, it, banal when I, say, I don't mean banal in terms of theory, banal in its use of old Marxist tropes. Mm. And obviously oppressed and oppressors and power structures. You know, It just seems to be very shallow compared to some of the theories we've discussed. In other words, it's mushrooming into all these tiny little bits of identity politics now in a way that, I, that certainly surprised me. Uh, I, have, I have a lot of respect, actually, for the post-colonial theories, Fanon and Said and so on, because I think they've taken yeah. it in a direction that really matters. 
because these are huge numbers of people we're talking about then, as opposed to tiny little groups in Western society, as it were. But uh, I think the you know the roots of critical race theory, for example, we came from the US, the US with Derek Bell, but you guessed it, Foucault and of course many of the people we've talked to before are oft quoted. But there's a big problem for me here that, that, that it's a form of Marxism which de-anchors language, knowledge, and belief from reality. In other words, oh, we just use these languages. It's all power structure. Uh, it's all power structures. It's the oppressed versus the oppressors. There is no reality any longer. But when you de-anchor things like this, you come up with all, all sorts of crazy theories because nothing is anchored in the real world any long, longer. So at Macintosh's white privilege type stuff the weirdness of the epistemic injustice movement, I find particularly like bizarre. Uh, well, all the time, the original Marxism had its focus on the poor and the underclass. They are now, funnily enough, <laughs> almost abandoned in Marxism in favor of the sort of middle and upper class Marxism, which is the new underclass, the new poor, the new oppressed are actually relatively wealthy people who just have a problem, a personal problem. And I, I think that's a shame because I think maybe one exception to that would be feminism. You know, that that that's I, I wouldn't include that in that group because I think although when women's studies moved to gender studies, it all got in my view a bit strange, the slicing and dicing of sexuality and so on, but uh, disassociated from biology. But I think I think as we saw this stuff emerge, the, the point I'm trying to put across here is that as an offshoot from postmodernism. It's taken over much of the human, uh, humanities and sociology in our universities, and now much of the discourse amongst young people. But that decoupling of language from reality, it, it's all part of that Marxist thing, really. And some of it is really good, but some of it is awful. So mm -hmm. I think it's the usual thing about such, the, the, you know, the post-enlightenment grand narratives, Freudian, Freud, let's say, utilitarianism, Marxism, even fascism, and so on, they've not turned out to be the solutions we thought they were. If anything, they've caused more conflict and strife and division than any healing of wounds. You talked about our, uh, Marxism within higher education. Uh, what about schools? Well, that yes, I, no, that's right. I, I focus a bit there on that, that more sort of high ideological type theorizing around postmodernism, which is very much a university system. But yeah. of course, the school schooling system I find myself in now is very different from the one I grew up in. Because it really is so focused on getting kids in, shoveling them towards university, corralling them towards this gate, which is the clearing system once a year. And our televisions are flooded by kids opening envelopes. Meanwhile, the other kids, not a peep about them, which is the majority, by the way. They, 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 they if anything, are suffering more than they've ever suffered from before because vocational learning and the options for them were, have dried up, really, you know, as all the money was spent in higher education. So I think schools have become as ide more ideological than they were in my day. Because I went to a school where only four people, only four people went to university out of the whole of my year. But the rest mm. of the people went on to live reasonable lives. You know, they they, they have lives. They're real people. Uh, but uh, these days, I find that you know I live in quite a comfortable sort of quite wealthy area in Brighton. But the people here, I, people here seem to have no contact with working class people. No, and then the schools themselves are still. Even though I sent my, you know, I could have well have afforded to send my kids to high-end private schools, I didn't for political reasons and social reasons. But I find it disturbing that uh, the schools, you know, the school governor, I saw this funneling towards universities and a sort of disregard for the poor that Marx sort of commented on in the Communist Manifesto. <laughs> Curiously, and these other theorists have been saying is part of the ideological view of schooling, and you know, the whole marking grading. You know, what, is the, what are these credentials? The credentials have become things we pay a lot of money for, and then the world just dutifully ignores them uh, as being irrelevant. Because when you move from theory into practice, which is what Gramsci said was an important thing to realize, the, th the world is very different. And uh, I feel that in answer to your question, John, schools could be subjected to a very interesting analysis as being ISAs in the Althusser sense of the mm -hmm. world. Uh, they still are, I think, because uh, they're serving the state and they're serving a certain uh, minority of class with it, with, uh, of people within society. Yeah, and I don't see that changing much. If anything, it's got worse in my life. 
to end on a more cheery note, perhaps we yes. could say that two of Marx's ideas uh, very early on expressed about education where we need to stop sending the kids up chimneys and we need them <laughs> to teach them how to read. Um, and those things have by and large happened. And if you're going to be Stephen Pinker about it, stuff has got better. Uh, yeah. So maybe we should thank him for that and say thank you and good night and thanks for all the fish. <laughs> There's one interesting, I was in Doha of all places in Qatar once, and I actually bumped into Gordon Brown there. I disagreed profoundly with what he had said in his speech, because his recommendation, of course, his recommendation from the Northern Hemisphere is let's get everybody schooling. As long as people can be read, can read, we'll be okay. So universal schooling is one of the big sustainable goals. Actually, it doesn't help that much, uh, because poverty remains. You can read and still be poor. What really matters is economic development and growth so that people have jobs and have fulfilling lives and can look after their children and live longer. And I feel that sometimes we think schooling and education is the solution to problems when it's not. And this was a cute observation by Gramsci as well. He, this is why he, did, he, he said institutional schooling. The answer to poor schooling is not more schooling. It's a different view of the world. Yeah. And on that bombshell... Thank you very much, Donald. No, thank you, John. That was, uh, I think we both had an interesting life here in our encounters with Marxism. I think we, we surfaced most of that quite nicely there. Great Minds on Learning comes from the Learning Hack team and is produced by John Helmer. The podcast is based on a series of blog posts written by Donald Clark, and we thank Donald for his kind collaboration in this project. If you'd like text summaries and transcripts for these podcasts, as well as ads free listening, early access to episodes, and more, why not join the Learning Hack Pack? For less than the price of a coffee, you can get all these benefits and help to sustain us into the future. Go to patreon.com forward slash learning hack for a seven day free trial. That's patreon.com forward slash learning hack.